It's according to intention now, okay? Because if a person who goes there and he thinks that he is Allah, completely is making a shirk. But if a person who goes there and he knows that this one, he knows Allah and Allah knows him, just like if you come to me and I happen to know President Obama, you know it's very difficult to reach to President Obama. You can send as many letters as you want, but you know it's difficult, but you know someone who's in the inside. Now you're going to ask me. I say, please, I have this problem. Can you solve it? Now, the person that you ask to, does the person acknowledge himself as a Lord, as a God? No. Does he acknowledge himself as someone who is near to Allah, as the Prophet was, that he can take the wishes heavy and the hopes of the people and he can present it to Allah. If he does that, Allah may refuse us because we are very far away from him and we are dirty. But there are some who are very beloved to Allah that whatever they ask, Allah accepts. This is called shafat. This is called intercession. And this is a very, very major, big thing that the Wahhabis, they hate. That is inside of the Aqidah of Ahli Sunnah, that is very important, that there is open hadith, that even the prophets from Hazrat Adam to Hazrat Ibrahim to everyone is going to ask for the intercession of the Holy Prophet The Ummat is going to run to see Hazrat Adam and say, we are in trouble on Judgment Day. Please pray for us. Ask, bring us to safety. Adam alayhi salam, I cannot because I've eaten from the forbidden fruit. I'm in trouble. They ran to every prophet. They even ran to Hazrat Isa. And Hazrat Isa is saying, I am ma'asum. I'm always protected. I didn't commit one single sin. But my people worship me as a god. And I may be questioned by my Lord. I cannot help you. But we're all here waiting for Ahmad. This is an open hadith. Huh? So, there are, there are people when they have wrong intentions and it becomes extreme, then it is important to put some vanguards there to say, don't go to an extreme. Like, we love the Kaaba, yes, but it's a stone. We're not going to go ah, crying to the Kaaba, you understand? Now, there are people who go to the graves and because they have such love to the person who has passed, who is beloved by Allah, who is holy, that Allah grants his wishes, they may lose themselves and they may cry. Okay? Hazrat Bilal did that. There are some Sahabis who cried at the tomb of the Prophet, asking him to come back, spoke directly to him. So, if you go with the wrong intention, it is wrong. If you go with the right intention and to ask, this is not only it's okay, it is harus, it is um, not obligation, it is encouraged for you to go and ask. But don't run to an extreme. Can tariqats go to extreme? Of course it can. Can Muslims go to an extreme? Of course we can. Does that mean all Muslims are terrorists? Of course not. Does that mean that all Sufis we are grave worshippers? Of course not. You see, there has to be a balance. So, we are encouraged to go to those ones who are close to Allah and to ask. What about you say, the person is not saying, ask Allah, the person is asking him. Huh? You go to a doctor, right? You ask the doctor, right? People who go to doctors and say, Doctor, can you help me? Muslim or non-Muslim? Does that constitute a shirk? If you say, Doctor, help me find a cure to help my loved one. Is that a shirk? Of course not. Why is that? You don't consider that doctor to be Allah, number one. And number two, you know that whatever is going to come is going to come from Allah, not from the doctor. So this is, this is common sense also. The Naqshbandi way, which I think your grandfather is also Naqshbandi Qadiri, 
it is ne? Kadiri. You cannot be full Kadiri if you're not Naqshbandi. Especially coming from your part of the world. They have to have both. It is a middle ground. Middle. When people do too much this side, we go to the other side to balance it. When people go too much this side, we go to the other side to balance it. When people are running to learn and that learning has become rotten, we say don't learn. When people are running not to learn and they're just making a zikr all day long and they enter into illusions and delusions, we say you have to learn. So tariqat is also dynamic. It is not a fossilized teaching from 1400 years and we're just putting it, transplanting it here and just having a museum method of teaching. You understand? It has to change. Now, the Naqshbandi way, the original Naqshbandi way of making a zikr, for example, it is a silent zikr. You don't even say anything. You have to reach to a certain level to be able to do that. There has to be permission. We're doing that here every night, the silent zikr. But the permission is now given to our grand sheikh once a week, especially Thursday nights, you're going to have a loud zikr. This is not in the tradition of the Naqshbandi order, loud zikr. But it is necessary. Why? Because there are people coming from the outside, people who don't know, non-Muslims. Now, we have to find a way to enter into them and for them to be attracted to the way of Allah. So you have a loud zikr. Sometimes the loud zikr can just be saying Allah. Sometimes the loud zikr can be ilahis. Just, you're giving the salawats. Now it is according to the uh, inspiration that comes and it is according to how the hearts are, what the hearts need and then we provide. So Imam Rabbani, are you familiar with Imam Rabbani? Okay, he is a Mujadid al-Thani, he is the second Mujadid, okay? That he changed the Hanafi Mazhab in a very huge way. Because the Naqshbandi Silsila, it went to India. And in India at that time, there was Islam and there was Tariqat as well. And people started deviating with Tariqat. So Imam Rabbani then put his foot down and says, no. Don't even play any music. Because you went too far. You went too, too extreme, no music. No nuts, no nothing. No kawali, no nothing. Just make zikr because it was needed at that time. They went so far away that he has to bring this to balance it. You understand? But now, this is according to the wisdom of the person that's given authority. Whatever is needed to make the person to eat dates, the person doesn't like dates, but a person likes, say, pudding. So we're going to make pudding and we're going to put dates in it. That way, they will get the benefit too. So this is according to intention, but in reality too, people who go and they ask directly to the Prophet or they ask directly to our, uh, the saint or to your grandfather, they are sincere. Ask them, you think my grandfather is Allah? Of course, of course not. Don't you know he's a servant of Allah too? He doesn't, he cannot grant you any heavy, any wishes? They say, yes, we know. But he is a beloved to Allah. It is Allah who grants. And Allah grant those ones who are beloved to him. So, you look at the situation. If there are people that all their lives they're doing wrong things, they're not even coming close to Islam, not doing anything, no love for the Prophet, no love for the awliya, and you see a person doing that, Wisdom is going to tell you, don't jump up and tell him this is a shirk. Slowly, at least he's making that connection. Now this is when tariqat Sufism enters, because it's a lot of wisdom, and it's not something which is literal. Like they say in Turkish, that man who doesn't pray, doesn't fast, he doesn't make zikr, but when he's drunk, he says Allah. Don't rush to condemn him too. Because who knows? When we are drunk, what are we going to say? 
And drinking is not just by this, liquor. You can be drunk with knowledge, with arrogance, with materialism, with anything. That you say, I am right, everyone else is wrong. So, there has to be a middle ground to this. And the intention is important. Is there a precedent? Is there a precedent for believers to go to the prophet's grave to cry, to ask directly from the prophet? Yes, there is. Do we encourage it? We don't really encourage it because people will go out of their way. Then what about kissing the grave, for instance? Kissing the grave. You go to the turba and you kiss the grave. Is there a precedent for this? Is there a sunnah? Yes, there is a sunnah for this. What about kissing the grave on the floor? Kissing the threshold, which the Ottoman sultans, they used to do. They have a room and they kept the khirqa sharif the jubba of the Prophet, his sword, his tooth, his hair, very holy. It is so holy that they come in. Before they can, they don't just walk in like that because it's the presence of the Prophet. Physically, he is there. They come in crawling and they kiss the threshold before they come. What is that kissing? It is respect. What is that kissing? Why you kiss the kid? It is love. Why you kiss the kid? I see people, they kiss their kid, they kiss their hands and their feet. Correct. Because it's just so cute. Now, when you love the Prophet ﷺ like that, and respecting him will never make you, respecting the Prophet, loving the Prophet will never make you to make a shirk. Never. The more you love the Prophet, the more you will love Allah. Because you know why? Because Allah loves the Prophet. So, these are different things. For example, we enter into, like I said, this is a precedent. You enter into a tomb, you enter into a holy place, you bend down and you kiss the threshold. There is a precedent for that. If it gets too much, if a person becomes, you know, too crazy about it, we may say, now stop. Because in Islam, there are different ways of showing respect, too. There is showing respect, giving salams. There is showing respect, putting your hand on your heart, saying salams. There is showing respect where you hug and you kiss on the cheeks three times. There is respect when you kiss the older person's hand. There is respect when you kiss the person's feet. There is respect. There is also respect. What is all this? In reality, what do you do when you are kissing someone's hand? What do you do? You bend down, don't you? You bend down and you kiss a person's hand. What do you do when you kiss a person's feet? You bend down and you kiss a person's feet. That one, that his hand or his feet are being kissed, the people who kiss my hand, do I, do, <laughs> do I like it? I hate it. I don't like it. It is very unusual. It is very weird. I know how dirty I am. And it is not worth it. But because my shaykh has commanded and he says, this is not your hand, this is my hand. I say, okay. Do you understand? This is now respecting that maqam. And ultimately, whose maqam is it? The prophets. And ultimately, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we are just a conduit. We are just a conduit. Now, a person can come to kiss my feet. Is there a precedent for that? Yes, it is. Do I like it? I don't like it. Because every time a person shows respect to me, it is obligation for me now to pray for that person Especially people, they come with certain spiritual diseases also. They come with certain energies that are heavy too. And when they touch, when they kiss my hand or they kiss my feet, I have to take it and I have to pray. It is very heavy for me. If there is a choice, I'm not even going to do it. But there is no choice. Because it's not me. This is not about me. This is about the maqam of the Prophet Now what if a person now comes and he bows down in front of me? He doesn't want to kiss my hand, but he just bows down. As first, I'm going to tell him, are you Japanese? Are you Chinese? If you're Chinese, you're Japanese, then I say, it's okay. Or are you Thai? Or are you Indian? In fact, there's so many cultures that they bow down, huh? In reality. Who are you bowing down to? What if a person comes and makes sajda? Sujud. There is another very hairy issue. Huh? 
Because they say you cannot make sajda except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do you know in shari, in shariat, there are different ways that the alims of 1400 years, of the four mashabs, millions of scholars, they have already categorized this. They say bowing down and to make sujood, there are different categories. It's not just one category. The Wahhabis say only one. No other interpretation, no other realities, only one. But Ahli Sunnah way, we say no. For example, when the angels, they make sujood to Adam alayhi salam. Who didn't want to make it? Shaitan. Because what did Shaitan say? I make sujood only to Allah, not to a man. I don't want to make shirk. But Allah is commanding. So there is an intention of what that sujood means and there is the object that you're making the sujood to. And the alims, the ulama, they've already categorized there are bows, there are rukus, there are bows that are made for honor, just to honor someone. It is not worship, it is not considered worship, it is permissible. There are sujood that is not considered worship, like the angels uh, making sujood to Adam alayhi salam. Is that worship? Were they worshipping to Adam alayhi salam and saying, you are Allah? No. Okay, we are not Adam, we are not angels. Let me pick humans. You know who else makes sujood to another human? His father and his mother made sujood to him. And his twelve brothers made sujood to him. Yeah, Yusuf alayhi salam. Is this in the Quran? Yes. Is it? Can you deny this? You cannot deny this. Obviously, they are all prophets, and they make sujood to their son. Is that a sujood to worship him? No. It is again respect. So niyat, it is very important. Niyat, it is the intention, it is very important. The Prophet ﷺ, one of his miracles, a tree came out, pulled itself out, from its roots and started to crawl to the Prophet. And he made sujood to the Prophet. And when he went up, the Prophet led it to make it, blessed it, and it went back. And there are animals who did that too. The Sahabi Kiram, those who felt like so much love to the Prophet, والسلام, they did it. Were they worshipping? It is not. Can this be abused? Anything can be abused. Anything can be abused. You say, well, we shouldn't do this because it might lead people to shirk. And this is a conversation between Ibn Taymiyyah and I forget the Ahli Sunnah scholar. The same logic. It says, well, we shouldn't open the ways that it may be abused. And you know what that scholar says? The scholar says, then it is like you saying that all unmarried men, they should be cut off. I'm speaking openly, because they might use it in the wrong way. You understand? Just because there is a potential for something to be misused, it doesn't mean that the object itself it is wrong. So, like I said, in 1400 years, we had someone with a sword to make sure that everything is within limits. Now. It's chaos, but there are still some who are keeping, trying to keep the balance. So, the intention, it is important. The sujud, is it something that we recommend? We don't recommend it, but some people, they are crazy. Maybe they look at me and they love me so much, I don't know why. I never ask people to love me. I'd rather just be quiet by myself. And they come in because they see my sheikh maybe. Because they're reminded of Allah, they're reminded of the Prophet, and they have so much. Now they come in, and the way that they show their extreme love is to come down and to kiss my feet. Now, I don't recommend it, and I say don't do it, especially in the open, when people will misunderstand, those who have wrong minds. But what can I do? There are crazy people everywhere. Hmm? There are crazy people everywhere. I don't like it. So many times people do that, I get very upset. I take my stick and I beat them. Ask him. But they're still doing it. Do they think I'm Allah? Of course not. 
But this, this is pretty simple to understand, the logic of it. Mm. It's very simple. It's very easy. For high intelligent people, they get it right away. It's like a light bulb that goes, oh, of course, yeah. It's very easy for them to understand. But for people who have no light bulb, then it's no light. I cannot turn it on. It's as much as I say, as much as we can say, inshallah. Any other question? Astaghfirullah, lazim wa tubulay.